Dear Ukrainian friends, I am uh, truly honored by speaking to you today. Before I start, let me convey to you the feelings of solidarity and support for your heroic struggle against the barbaric aggressor from all Polish academic community. Let me tell you also that I have informed about your conference a number of my international colleagues and all of them asked me to pass to you their warm greetings. Now, let me start. Years ago, Samuel Huntington predicted a clash of civilizations mistakenly opposing the West and Islam. The true war of civilizations is occurring nowadays between free and democratic world and despotic Russian empire. President Reagan was so right calling it the empire of evil and all later talk about the reset of relations was so terribly wrong. Ukraine is on the very front line of the war of civilizations at the limits of civilizations defending us all the people of Europe and America, the Western democratic world. But I propose today not to dwell on the horrors of war, but rather to focus on the aftermath of war and long range perspective for the Ukrainian society. I have titled my uh, talk, The Bright Side of a Tragedy on the unintended and unanticipated consequences of the barbaric aggression. And let me start with a bit of theory. There is an important sociological tradition to consider the unintended and unanticipated consequences of social events. My master and mentor or Robert K. Merton claimed that the study of such consequences, which he also labeled latent functions, is of particular heuristic importance. In his own words, let me quote, in short, he says, it is suggested that the distinctive un uh, intellectual contributions of the sociologist are found primarily in the study of unintended consequences of social practices, among which are latent functions. Merton himself, as well as a number of other scholars, selected a particular attention, the category of consequences, which are directly contrary to the intentions of the actors to manifest functions of social actions and events, contrary to manifest functions. He calls them boomerang effects or suicidal self-destroying prophecies. More or less at the same time, Karl Raymond Popper in his book on open society and its enemies was writing about the outcomes of revolutions as contrary to the intentions of revolutionaries. Raymond Boudon and Anthony Giddens used the term perverse effects. Jon Elster, the guru of rational choice school, calls it the condition of counter finality. In fact, the idea is very old to be found already in the Bible when uh, the disobedience to God and eating an apple from forbidden tree in paradise has dramatic consequences for Adam and Eve and supposedly, at least for the believers, for all humanity as original sin. In economy, the idea appears in the invisible hand of the market by Adam Smith, in philosophy, in the notion of cunning of reason, by Wilhelm Hegel. In modern sociology, this idea has been applied 
to the area of social conflict. Louis Kozer, inspired by the classical writings of Georg Simmel, argues, contrary to common sense, that conflict, both at the micro level of groups and at the macro level of whole societies, may have positive functions and ultimately bring about beneficial consequences. He writes, I quote, far from being only a negative factor which tears society apart, social conflict may fulfill a number of determinate functions for groups and other interpersonal relations. They may reveal themselves most clearly in the long run. Enough of this theoretical background. Now, in the spirit, in this spirit, in the darkness of war, amid the violence, human tragedies and destruction, I am trying to find some bright perspectives for the post-war future of the Ukrainian society, unintended and unpredicted by the vicious aggressor, and eventually contrary to his goals. And I have found 10. Let me consider one after another. First, we observe <clears throat> the reawakening and strengthening of the national Ukrainian identity in its core spiritual and emotional meaning. Ukraine is part of me, writes on the pages of Scandinavian journal Baltic words, Dmitro Drozdovsky, a fellow at the Shevchenko Institute of Literature in Kiev. It is well known that such an emotional social identity is articulated most clearly by opposition. We versus them. Let me quote Louis Coser again. It seems to be generally accepted by sociologists, he says, that the distinction between ourselves, the we group or in group, and everybody else or the other groups, out groups, is established in and through conflict. There is no more important condition for the unambiguous definition of we than the situation of war, and particularly the barbaric external aggression. And there is no better occasion to draw clear borders against them. Contrary to the plans of the aggressor, the Ukrainian national spirit and strong emotions of Ukrainian national identity are being reborn. Second, there is the outbreak of mobilization of responsible citizenship and civil society by self-organization, solidarity, mutual support and help. The aggressive war creates an imperative of defense and produces consolidation of the whole society over and above any existing divisions. The common universal predicament and goal of preserving the existence of the whole country wipe out any particular group interests and intergroup animosities. The Ukrainian people are passing the test of Republican citizenship as defined by David Miller, the fellow of Nuffield College at Oxford. I quote, being willing to take active steps to defend the rights of the other members of the political community and more generally to promote the common interests and particularly to be ready to volunteer for public service when the need arises. Hence, the national identity in the second civic meaning is also strongly affirmed. Third, the state and particularly the army acquired the new level of legitimacy due directly to the military successes, but also 
the ability to keep up basic infrastructure, <clears throat> providing at least for the elementary survival needs of the citizens, despite the furious inhuman attacks of the enemy. As sociology and political science teach us, the most important way to win legitimacy is to be effective in responding to the expectations of the people. The Ukrainian state is successfully passing the ultimate test. In effect, the national identity in its third meaning, political meaning, is strengthened. Fourth, there is the emergence of authentic charismatic leader who wins trust and respect both internally from the Ukrainian people and externally from the foreign countries. Just this week, his image appeared on the front page of Time magazine as the man of the year. His charisma is due to the right decisions and policies, but also personal courage, moral strength, and unwavering determination in the struggle. Charisma, as Max Weber taught us long ago, is only partly given by inborn personality traits. It flourishes fully when a gifted person finds oneself in the right spot at the right time, jumps on the chariot of history, and is able to create a unique chemistry with the followers, with the people. The aggression created the opportunity for your president, and he has used it in the most inspiring way. Pips, in the everyday life, one sees the raising level of personal resilience of the people and successful coping strategies of survival in the inhuman conditions and deprivations of war. The self-exemplifying case is this very conference. The fact that the university provided reserve power generators for the conference, as Olga told me, to be carried out according to plan, in spite of the threat of blackout and air raids, is immensely impressive. Could you imagine that decades ago when uh, the Ukrainian Review of Sociology was founded? People learn by experience, and dramatic experience provides the strongest lessons. The Ukrainian people are much hardened against any future threat. The national identity in its force, mundane, everyday sense emerges. American social psychologist William Isaac Thomas has coined the phrase known as Thomas theorem. If people believe something to be real, it is real in its consequences. As long as the Ukrainian people believe in victory, victory will be yours. It will trigger the mechanism of self-fulfilling prophecy, the benign spiral of optimism and empowerment. Do not allow resignation, tiredness, gloom to set in. Avoid as much as you can vicious spiral of defeat. Six, there is the sharp and ambiguous definition of the border between the enemies and friends of the Ukrainian people. And in case of my own country, Poland, and the Ukrainian-Polish relations, the final overcoming and forgetting the tragic moments of confrontations in the past. The powerful sign and catharsis of what was of that was the spontaneous grassroots massive mobilization of Polish volunteers helping Ukrainian refugees at the Polish border. 
In the recent issue of the New York Review of Books, there is a touching report of an American student working side by side with Polish students to help the Ukrainian refugees at Przemysl. We, the Poles, share the proverb with the Ukrainians. You have to be in need to discover who your real friends are. Seventh, there is the final affirmation of the pro-Western aspirations and hopes of the Ukrainian society for the assured and dignified place in the democratic Europe. This has been confirmed strongly by the opening of the accession procedures for the European Union and the Euro-Atlantic Alliance, those organizational anchors of the West. Eighth, there is strong, almost unanimous global recognition and support for the independence and territorial integrity of Ukraine as witnessed by the resolution of United Nations voted by more than 120 member states. The providing of military supplies, humanitarian aid, and huge sums of economic subsidies by the United States and the countries of the European Union is another material proof of the same intentions. It shows international understanding of the wisdom phrased already a century ago in 1918 by Georg Simmel in the letter to Graf Hermann Kaiserling, I quote, if Europe manages to recover after the war, if the thought spreads that this war is a common prediction for all parties and that the healing of its wounds must be a common task in which all must assist each other, only then Europe will regain its strength in the foreseeable future. It did not work what Zimmel says, it did not work for Europe at that time. Hopefully it will work now. One may also add a strong resolve of Western countries to put all guilty of atrocities and genocide before the international courts of justice. Now number nine of my list of bright spots in the darkness. We witness worldwide condemnation, isolation, and sanctions against the aggressor, treated as a terrorist state, violating brutally all rules of international law and warfare conventions. The boycott and embargo on uh, Russian resources and supplies is significantly weakening its imperial economic potential. Parallel to that, in internal policies of a number of countries, the populist pro-Moscow parties and organizations are marginalized. There is also one side effect of a different nature, namely because of the missing resources, particularly of oil and gas, the European societies are pushing strongly toward the search for renewable energy. The green movements, the ecological movements seem to be winning as a side effect of the situation. And now number 10, there is the profound integration and consolidation of the European Union and NATO Alliance in the affirmation of the fundamental imperatives and values of freedom, self-determination of nations, democracy, and peace. This overall higher purpose is pushing aside internal differences between various countries, internal cleavages. The anchors of the Western world are stronger than ever. This is my list, my list of 10 bright 
lights in the night of war. The price you are paying for all this is immense and the suffering and human toll unforgivable and unforgettable. But the war will end one day. And independent of the military effect, the society has already won the battle. Let me quote young man Drozdowski again, speaking for his whole generation. He says, what is most important for me is the idea of a deep transformation that we now have in our society that has been united to defend the country. As the British sociologist Paul Connerton argues persuasively, social memory is most strongly rooted via commitments and actions. The experience of war, participation in the heroic struggle, overcoming mortal threats, sacrifices, and martyrology are the memories which will be carried over in time for generations. They will be articulated and sharpened in what I call the meaning industry, stories, myths, literature, drama, film, poetry, the media. In effect, so much unintended and unrecognized by the vicious aggressor, the Ukrainian society will become reborn, renewed, much stronger than earlier, free, independent, and democratic. The Polish people wish you just that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Stomka, that you share with us your realistic optimism vision, uh, your ideas and arguments concerning the uh, possible positive uh, consequences of the of the war. It is really very important uh, to uh, consider to look uh, at the current event, current tendency not only due to we are the uh, tragic uh, features, but also to find uh, that positive, strong tendency, arguments, factors uh, that will be able to support the uh, future positive development of uh, the society. Thank you so much and uh, dear colleague, uh, Professor Stonka proposed a uh, rather uh, provocative thesis uh, concerning the positive consequences uh, of uh, this state of society, state under the war. Uh, so please, uh, if you have uh, any question to Professor Stonka or comments, or maybe uh, you uh, would like to add uh, something more to uh, the uh, to 10 thesis uh, declared by professor. So please, uh, we invite you. We have uh, some time for discussion. And uh, I, I ask uh, everybody who, who like to uh, say something, uh, yes, to to put uh, the uh, the hand, uh, or uh, to uh, give voice sign. So please, uh, Margarita Shirokova. Вітаю всіх учасників конференції. День добрий, пані професоре. Bardzo nam miło witać pana profesora na naszym wydarzeniu i jesteśmy wdzięczni za takie świeże i pouczające przemówienie. Uh, the Ukrainian people are also grateful to all Poles who help us in our struggle. Uh, dear professor showed us uh, his vision uh, of the long-term consequences and benefits of the war for Ukraine. And uh, the Ukrainian people uh, 
can not only accept uh, help and uh, mobilize for battles on the front line. They also know that they uh, have to be grateful for the help and hand of Western countries. The idea of uh, a public servant can be expressed in considering the outcome of the war as a responsible victory. We are responsible for our own future. In other terms, uh, uh, is there a future for Ukraine after future? <laughs> uh, what do you think after the war? What would be an adequate response of Ukraine to outside help, especially realizing that our financial, human, infrastructural resources are largely destroyed? Thank you. May I may respond at once rather than collecting the questions, okay? It will be more like a dialogue then. So let me tell you, well, as you know, of course, and of, of course you know it very well um, also in your country, but uh, after World War II, my country was terribly, destroyed and particularly our capital Warsaw was wiped out by the Nazis completely. It, it was a, a ruin, a field of ruins after the Warsaw uprising and the retaliation by the Nazi forces who killed uh, several hundred thousand of people there and put the whole capital out of existence. It was a flat land full of ruins, almost nothing there. My parents lived in Warsaw and myself, I was born in Warsaw just some months before the Warsaw uprising and the destruction of the city. Luckily, because my uncle, was a colonel in the underground army. He gave a hint to my family to take me out of Warsaw to some little village outside. And only because of that, I can speak to you today. Only because of that, I was saved. Even on the road, my parents were pushing the little cart with myself on the road just walking to the village of Milanovek, just some 15, 20 kilometers from Warsaw. On the road, there was some army shooting, some clash between the underground and the Nazis. And only when we arrived there, my parents found that there was a hole in the cover of my cart. Uh, there was a bullet which went through just 20 centimeters over my head. So again, uh, you know, I, I am sort of, uh, well, witness to what may happen in war. And the message which I want to convey after uh, to your question is that Polish people after the war decided not to move the capital to some other city, which was less destroyed, but to rebuild Warsaw, to rebuild it from scratch. And that was authentic. Of course, it was communist rule at that time, but the spirit and the mobilization of the people for the rebuilding of the capital and also other, other parts of the country, but I am speaking about, about Warsaw particularly, it was a tremendous grassroots mobilization. People were working there, they were volunteering, they were uh, working extremely hard. And now you may travel and you may see how Warsaw looks like. So I think that is, the, that is the answer, that is the lesson. If people are able to mobilize, to get together, 
in the big cause of restoring the country or restoring the cities to the greatness of before the war period, it will be done. It will be done. It can't be done from above. It can't be done by any orders or uh, laws imposed upon the people. It must be the popular movement of restoration, rebuilding, regaining the pre-war greatness, both of the country and of the particular cities, Kiev, Kharkov, many other, which were so badly destroyed partly or wholly by the aggressor. That would be my personal, personal memory and my personal answer to your important question. Thank you so much. Polish Thank case you very is much. very important case, lesson for Ukraine just now. So please, uh, Svetlana Bavienka, uh, your question or uh, comment. Yes, thank you so much, Professor Stomka. It's really, first of all, I want to express gratitude to Polish people and uh, to Polish scholars who also help sociological community to uh, in this uh, first uh, and coming days of war. It's really, uh, really great to find ourselves as uh, really friends in the one side of the, in the one boat. Thank you so much for your presentation today. And uh, my question is um, uh, about uh, uh, what is your opinion and what is your vision on a prospect of uh, Russia after the end of the war? So uh, what do you think about the, uh, what is the positive scenarios for Ukraine, Poland, Baltic State, Georgia, and all the neighboring countries? Um, after uh, the victory of Ukraine and uh, um, with, uh, that could follow by, by mass migration of Russian people and uh, uh, a lot of Russians are already abroad and uh, have a lot of um, voice and so on. Uh, so uh, what, what and how do you think the scenarios what should be done uh, from the side of the democratic world to Russia after the war and uh, how do you perspect uh, how do you see this trend of uh, and request on cancel Russia culture. Thank you. Very hard question. Very hard question, but uh, one answer is that we, I mean the Western European democratic societies and the United States are much wiser now due to your tragic experience and we are able to defend ourselves better in the future. We are trying to put stronger military resources at our borders. Just recently in Poland, we are installing Patriot launching system and I and a bomb uh, American system, which was passed to us from Germany. And other countries do the same. We are better prepared. Of course, we are threatened. The empire has very big taste. Every empire has had this tendency to grab more and more of the neighboring countries. But I think, the, as I said, we are much better prepared. We, we, I mean, the West is forgetting about that nonsense about appeasement or about reset, the relations with Russia on some cooperative basis. There was a big uh, error, I believe, in uh, um, flirting with Russia about the gas uh, supplies and all those pipelines 
uh, which were built uh, through Germany and, and uh, Baltic Sea, etc., which are now not operating anymore. But that was a big, big, big mistake to make Europe dependent on Russian resources. We are wiser now. That is, that is one thing which uh, has to do with the external defense against this threat. I don't know much about internal outcome of the war for Russia. Of course, the, the military part of that is one aspect. As a sociologist, I believe more important aspect is the human part, namely whether Russian people will open their eyes to the realities instead of being subjected to propaganda, to Kremlin ideology, to some outbreak of imperial nationalism and other consequences. Since the war started, I haven't been in any touch with uh, Russian colleagues. I have had a number of Russian colleagues but we haven't been in touch because somehow they did not look for exchange of points of view. And I was also sort of afraid to hear from them that they, for example, support the current Russian policies. So um, if the Russian people are able in masses to follow the lead of some intellectuals, some people in the opposition, some uh, groups living in the big cities, which have different perspective, if the rest of this Russian society will somehow follow and will open their eyes and understand. And my hope is um, in this recruitment process, because recruitment means taking your sons from your families and putting them to the front and bringing back in coffins. And that is the experience which is over and above the propaganda and over and above the, the messages coming from Kremlin, ideological messages. So I can't tell you much more. Of course, I am reading, I am listening, I am uh, well, just recently, uh, I have read a very telling book by the author who would never be suspected of writing such stories, such things about Russia, namely Maxim Gorky. Maxim Gorky wrote a book which was not known for a long time called Russia. And he was writing about so-called Russian spirit in an extremely insightful way, very critical, extremely strong about some tendencies in the Russian society, not recent, but coming from the ages before, from the Tsars and, and the imperial tendencies, wars, etc. But that is as much as I know now. I, I don't know really any insider perspective about what is going on in Russia. I expect to listen to Polish correspondents in Moscow and uh, the reports they give. The reports are not very optimistic, I must say. Not yet, at least. Not very optimistic as far as this spirit of Russian society is concerned. And as to the future, well, one may also hope that in a tangible material sense, Russia may be weaker than before, but uh, there are immense resources of land, of people in Russia, so it is very hard to say how much the sanctions and the isolation, international isolation will work. 
I can only hope that once the war ends, the West will not start again on this uh, romance with Russia and will be wiser by the experiences of today. That's yeah. all I have to say. Thank you, thank you. And uh, I just wonder, uh, it's another big topic, it's just a comment, not a question, but uh, is uh, uh, the, the same strategy of the West to, to Russia as it worked after the World War II to Germany could work for Russia? But uh, again, it's a much bigger society, much more different by uh, state of society in itself uh, right now. So it's uh, for me, it's a really a big part of the question of the bright future of Ukraine, because, uh, you know, it is still on the place, uh, big and uh, populated. And uh, um, even if it is uh, uh, with uh, imperial ambitions, not for just last 10, 20, 30 years, it's imperial ambitions of centuries, because it started World War II, it, uh, and these ambitions uh, like uh, Germany between after the First World War and uh, it's Russia after the Cold War. So it's uh, it's not uh, it's in a big waves of history. It's not mm -hmm. a surprise. And uh, so, uh, but but what what response should we give and what? Could we make uh, just desolation border cancel Russian culture like uh, we, we uh, see it now, or could it be something else? But it's just a big task to think further. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So please, uh, Professor uh, Natalia Chernich. Uh, dear Professor Stompka. Uh, I like to to hear and listen uh, you, and it's very nice to meet you again. And we wait you in Lviv once more because it is a good tradition. Uh, your visit visits uh, to our uh, city. And my question is very simple. Now the uh, new book of Andrew Wilson appears in a scientific space and title is the ukrainians the story of how a people became a nation as for me it is the main results of this war uh, do you agree or disagree or, to, or what is your notion about such a title could you repeat the title? Because I lost the last most important word in the title. Yeah. Um, the title is The Ukrainians, the story of how a people became a nation. How the people, Ukrainian people, became a nation. Become Americans? Or, or did I hear correctly? No. Became no. a nation. Nation. A nation. Nation, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, well, I, I from what I said before, I believe uh, I am in full agreement with that okay, point. Thank you. Thank you so much. With that point that, uh, of course, uh, Ukraine was and has been a nation before, but <clears throat> nations are born several times. And uh, that was true of Polish nation. You know perfectly well that we were um, without state for one century in the 19th century, uh, divided among three superpowers, uh, three empires around us. And uh, then uh, in 1920, after the First World War, we had the second rebirth of Poland as a nation. Some right. people believe that in 1989, after the collapse of Soviet Empire, we had the third birth of Polish nation. So the countries have number of situations when this national strength, national feeling is uh, raised, is raised tremendously. And of course, <clears throat> the war mm, is the occasion uh, for that. 
so I, I would think that uh, in many senses, which I try to indicate in my talk, in many senses, the Ukrainian identity is stronger and reborn, including the first meaning. Let me repeat the meaning first, meaning, uh, namely the national emotional feeling attachment to the country, its culture, its language, its uh, tradition, its stories, myths, uh, everything. That is the first meaning, and that's very important. The second meaning is civic uh, identity, namely the feeling that we are citizens that we are citizens of the state and that we have obligations, but also uh, we can expect from the state something for us. Our obligation is to participate, to create a civil society, to be active, to, to try to self-organize uh, in the grassroots movements, uh, clubs, uh, discussion groups, etc. That is the second type of identity, which I also found very important in the context of current Ukrainian situation. And the third meaning, to repeat, is the um, feeling of legitimacy of your state. Yes. You may have national feelings in the first sense, but not in the third, in this state legitimacy sense. That was the case in Poland during the whole 19th century. We had a national feelings, culture, literature, uh, values, but we could not feel any legitimacy to the foreign countries occupying Poland during the full century with uh, some more, 20 years more than a century. Uh, so this, but, when this legitimacy of the state is united with the emotional identity of the national feelings, that is the best possible situation. And this, the number four identity, I labeled it this, is the identity of resilience, the identity of common people in everyday life, when they can observe others, and see how they are able to defend their lives and their everyday functioning and how some institutions, local institutions, volunteers are able to overcome immense and, and um, hard to describe difficulties of life. This resilience is also feeling of identity, a different type of feeling. So, when those four things are coming together, I am optimistic. That's the basis of my, well, optimism, which I wanted to pass to you, because I see from the outside, I am just an outsider, I don't have any insider understanding, but it seems to me that in your case now, those four dimensions of identity are bound together. And that's why you are stronger now than before. Thank you so much. I ask about it because before we have uh, we had uh, two uh, models of nation, ethnic nation and political or civic nation. And now I think that uh, we have uh, as a result of this war, uh, the birth of uh, Ukrainian newest political nation. Exactly, exactly. Thank you so much. That is, that is exactly important point to make, yes. Yes, welcome to Lviv. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. And maybe uh, uh, the last question for, for the session. Uh, Professor Stomka uh, told more, uh, his thesis is uh, more about uh, the positive consequences of the war to society. But my question is about uh, the impact of the war to 
sociological, sociological theory. Uh, what main challenges to sociological theory uh, can you outline taking into account the impact of the war, long-term instability, uh, a huge of unexpected events, uh, which uh, destroy the traditional visions of society. Uh, could you propose, could you consider uh, the uh, renewed or new wave of sociological terrorizing, terror design, of, uh, which we all could involve to develop uh, for the present and future, please? Yes, well, of course, any input to sociological theory must go via empirical research. I don't believe in theories coming from, uh, from uh, the pure inspiration or from the heaven. Uh, I believe that theories try to generalize, to put together, to build models, to build general perspectives on the basis of empirical evidence. Sometimes the empirical evidence is a common sense observation, very important in my view. Sometimes it is representative research, surveys, etc., etc. But what comes out of uh, the war for sociological theory is, I think, to be found in your empirical studies. Um, it is very, perhaps, uh, brutal, paradoxical to say that the war provides a kind of natural experiment of a huge mm -hmm. size, tragic, awful, and yet to be used by sociologists or social psychologists or other scholars to have better insights into the operation of society under such tremendous conditions of inhuman stress, inhuman uh, losses, sacrifices, etc. If I were asked which direction such a theory grounded in empirical research in your first-hand knowledge of the situation, if I were asked which direction, I would uh, recall the concept of social and cultural trauma. Social and cultural traumas, which I have written a bit about, and uh, in fact, I, I was responsible for <laughs> devising that uh, concept, taking it from medicine and, and using it in sociology. It happened when we were together with uh, some international friends doing a program, writing a book in the Stanford Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences. And we were hired by Hewlett Corporation, the computer corporation from uh, Palo Alto, which wanted to find out what are the consequences of sudden unexpected social change. Mm -hmm. Well, and we were working on that and we were looking for some concept for our theoretical research. It was a group of five people from five countries. And uh, I, I hit on this idea of trauma that in fact, social change, mm -hmm. both in the negative way, which is closest to the medical meaning, as a harm to the body, as the breaking of normal routines of life, as breaking of normal conditions of life due to some accident or something, that that may be applied to societies in negative sense, but also in positive sense, that trauma may be the outcome also of the breakdown in normative rule structure of the society mm -hmm. in the positive sense, in the sense of revolution, in the sense of, of some basic 
transformation. I was focusing on that because that was the time when uh, the Soviet uh, empire uh, pulled down and uh, Poland has become free uh, country. And I was observing even in those extremely positive conditions, which we hoped for very much at that time, a kind of trauma, a kind of trauma because at the basic level of life, the, the routines, the typical reactions, the customs were broken. People were living in a different world suddenly. Now, the passing from the war conditions to the peace conditions after quite prolonged period of that inhuman different experience of breaking your life of doing things which you have never been doing before uh, evading the air raids going to the hiding, escaping, emigrating, at least temporarily to other countries, all those things which you would never dream about in the peacetime. Now you return to the normal routines, normal life. And that may also be a strange paradoxical type of trauma for some short period. Like now, of course, there is much more painful, much more deep trauma when your life is, is uh, precarious. It is no longer taken for granted. It is no longer something you may predict from day to day. Uh, so the concept of trauma in both meanings, the trauma of a very sad, bad sort and the trauma accompanying good changes if they are somehow sudden, unexpected, and when break down the normal routines of life. That would be the direction of thinking. But perhaps I am too much attached to this notion and I am sure you know, on the basis of the empirical research and insider knowledge of the current war, you may arrive at completely different and better perspective.